Reach Freaks. Hey everyone, the last few weeks have been devastating for just about everyone across the globe due to the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. As we all learn to adjust to new normals, myself included as a one-person podcast production, I've decided to release two premium mini-episodes from our Patreon archives this week. Visit the link in the show notes to learn more about Invisible Choir Premium, where you can expect weekly mini-episodes just like the ones you'll hear today, physical limited edition perks, and much more. Now go to patreon.com forward slash invisible choir to sign up for just $5 per month today. We're also running a special limited time offer, giving listeners access to two Invisible Choir Uncensored episodes absolutely free. Invisible Choir Uncensored examines the most heinous cases that are far too graphic for the public feed and is only available to our $15 confidential informant level supporters on Patreon. Click the link in the show notes or go to invisiblechoir.com forward slash uncensored to learn more. Thank you all so much for listening and for your continued support of the show. Take care of each other and stay safe out there. Reach Freaks. Invisible Choir explores detailed depictions of violence and murder and is not appropriate for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. I don't know what happened. You're all beat up, right? So tell me what happened. I don't know. I just want to go to sleep, man. I've been in your world. I've been in your world. Welcome to another edition of Felony Friday on Invisible Choir Premium. I'm your host, Michael Ojibwe. In light of ongoing delays for our next full episode, I'm releasing a special extended Friday mini so today to keep everybody happy. And this one is absolutely crazy. It's one that I first learned about years ago, and every twist and turn still has me mystified to this day. This case gets at the very root of what Invisible Choir stands for, to critically examine otherwise preventable crimes. And though not all crimes themselves are necessarily preventable, law enforcement responses in the immediate aftermath sometimes triggers more questions than answers, and they sometimes inadvertently compound the damage. This is definitely one of those cases, so hang on for a wild ride. I'm calling this one Guilty Until Proven Innocent. December 25th, 2006. The Waller family gathers for Christmas dinner in the Desert Hills region of Scottsdale, Arizona, just 30 miles northeast of Phoenix. It's an established family tradition by now, and the plans have been set months in advance. But as the evening hours roll on and family members gather, eat, and enjoy the mini reunion of sorts, there is a noticeable absence in the family home. 18-year-old Ryan Waller, who shares an apartment with roommates in Phoenix, is a no-show. As the minutes turn into hours and the late evening closes in, Ryan's mother grows increasingly concerned. He isn't answering or returning any of her phone calls, and it's not like Ryan to miss such an important family gathering. So as people are saying their goodbyes and planning their departures, she calls Phoenix police to request a welfare check on her son. Something seems terribly amiss. Something's off. And the Waller family's worst fears were validated when police finally arrived on scene at his home just off West Glen Drive at around 1 o'clock that following morning on December 26th. Responding police knocked on Waller's front door repeatedly with no response, but as they stood in the front of the modest four-bedroom ranch-style home, they could hear the television blaring behind the heavy steel front door. So one of the officers walked around the front of the home and peered inside one of the living room windows. There, on the couch in front of the TV, was a noticeably bloodied body. Police called for backup and eventually forced their way inside, where they discovered a gruesome crime scene. 21-year-old Heather Kwan, Ryan Waller's then-girlfriend, had been shot execution-style once in the head with a small-caliber handgun, her body laying unresponsive on the living room couch. But as police cleared the home, they found someone else inside, someone still alive. It was 18-year-old Ryan Waller. He was wandering about the home when police arrived, mumbling to himself. His face showed clear signs of an assault, his left eye and nose completely blackened, and his face noticeably swollen. He seemed a bit dazed and confused. In the midst of his ramblings, Waller claimed that both he and his girlfriend had been shot, but the details were fuzzy. The police, not wanting to take any chances in the event Waller was responsible for coldly murdering his girlfriend, handcuffed the 18-year-old and walked him outside of the home, placing him into a nearby patrol car while they continued investigating the crime scene. There was also another female roommate present inside the home, in her bedroom, but she claimed that she had arrived home late in the evening hours and went straight to bed, never realizing that Waller's girlfriend lay dead on their living room couch. She had simply thought the young woman had fallen asleep while watching TV. Police continued working the scene for nearly four and a half hours. Ryan Waller, all the while, remained handcuffed in the patrol car in front of the home, until shortly after 5.30 that morning when police finally brought him into the station for questioning. His clothes were confiscated as evidence, and he was given a bright white plastic jumpsuit to wear while the detective was called in to question him. But something wasn't adding up. His behavior was extremely bizarre, and his claims were all over the place. What exactly did Ryan Waller know? And more importantly, what had he done? 
As he sits in a brightly lit interrogation room awaiting the detective's arrival, he sits on the chair as a small child might, repeatedly lifting his feet onto the seat and a couple of times bringing them to rest upon the top of the table. He then begins playing with the chained cuff attached to the table, repeatedly clicking the handcuff before gently placing it upon his own wrist, effectively cuffing himself while police had otherwise let him sit free. He repeatedly shuffles uncomfortably in the chair and at one point rests his head in his hands, gently whimpering the entire time as if in pain. After about a 15 minute wait, and just before 6 a.m., a detective finally enters the room. It's time to find out what Ryan Waller is hiding, what he actually knows. This one towards, there you go. No, I'm going the other one. Oh, okay. Move this one out. Move this one out. There you go. Okay. I just want to go to sleep. That will happen sooner or later. The detective enters the room and instructs Ryan Waller to remove his feet from the tabletop, but not before extending them out so an evidence technician can take high-resolution photographs of the soles of his bare feet. He also mentioned taking two swab samples of what appears to be blood running down one of his legs. Ryan Waller is clearly considered an early suspect in Heather Kwan's murder, even though he appears mildly concussed at minimum after having suffered some type of assault to his own face. All right, do I get to go home? I don't know. You should go to the doctor. Where you should go. Me? Yeah. Why? Is that? Yeah. Is it bad? I'd say that's really bad. I just want to go to sleep. That's it. No, this, if, you have a, if you have a concussion, you don't need to sleep. That's what the doctors will say. So I'll put your feet on the table like that. Let's put them straight on the table. <laughs> Waller's face is continually swelling throughout his interview, the black eye on his left side now gradually extending over to the right. The waiting detective even making note of how bad his injuries appear, joking that he should be at the doctor's office instead of at the police station. After the technician returns and takes two swab samples from Waller's feet, he spends nearly a minute and a half searching for the lens cap from his camera joking with the other detective that it has gone missing. Given his obvious injuries, they don't seem to be in any hurry to begin questioning the suspect, seated directly across the table from them. I am Detective Dalton. My name is Waller, W-A-L-L-E-R. Yeah. You know why you're down here, Ryan? You have no idea why you're down here? Mm -hmm. Okay. Ryan, I, I'm gonna... Let me read you something, so I, you can under, you understand, uh, because... I don't understand. I don't know what happened. Okay, so I'm gonna read you something to make sure you understand your rights. Okay, basically I'm gonna read it. You've seen cops before, right? Never seen a TV show cops or CSI or anything like that. Okay. Never seen that. No. You've never seen any kind of cop show, lawyer show, any kind of show. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. I want you to listen up real close. Okay, you have the right to remain silent. Detective Dalton from the Phoenix Police Mirandizes the 18-year-old. Though it is clear he is struggling to comprehend the preliminary questions asked of him, they proceed on with the interrogation. What's the um, highest grade you went through school? I don't know. I don't know. You don't know what the highest grade you went through? Eighth. Eighth, eighth grade? Did you graduate? Yeah. Did you, do you have a GED? I don't know. You don't uh, know what? I don't know. I don't know. I just want to go home. Oh, you're, you're not going to go home right now. So what? What's the highest grade that you completed? B? No. Not, not grade, as in letter grade. I'm asking, did you graduate high school? No. And the highest you went was eighth grade? Mm hmm. Yep. Yeah. Do you know how to read and write, Ryan? Yeah. The detective pauses as if to take stock of the situation unfolding in front of him. Clearly, Ryan Waller is extremely confused and exhausted, but he doesn't seem to be understanding even the simplest of questions. But instead of calling for an immediate medical evaluation, the detective proceeds on. Do you have a girlfriend? Uh, no. Do you know, you know a girl named Heather? Mm-hmm. Do you know Heather's last name? Mm-hmm. What is Heather's last name? Um, the one that lives there right now? I guess. I don't know. If her name's Heather, what's her last name? Um, I don't know which name she's trying to use as her last one. She's trying to have a real last as her nickname, so I don't know. What nickname does she go by? She probably wants the last name, Kymie. Kaiman? How would you spell that? With a K or a C? K. Keep going. I don't know. How old is Heather? 16 or 17. Is she a white girl? Yeah. How did you meet Heather? I've known her. Since school. I don't know. You just known her from school? She used to be a business name. I don't know. She used to be do a business name? She used to be in my book named with business name. Oh, okay. 
She was being a class, your business class. Mm -hmm. Waller's answers are not even in the realm of reality. His girlfriend, Heather Kwan, is not Caucasian, and she's 21 years old, not 16 or 17. Realizing that Waller is either refusing or incapable of answering these simple questions, he starts with the basics. What happened to your face? I don't know. You told the officer just a few minutes ago that someone hit you. Do you remember who hit you? Um, I don't know. I think it was Heather. Why would Heather hit you? I don't know. It was an accident. I forgot why. What was an accident? Heather's last name? No. What was an accident? Heather hitting me. What did she hit you with? Her hand and the eye. Did you guys have an argument? Not really, no. Not really? Uh-uh. What happened for her to hit you in the eye like that? She just hit me on accident. She was giving Christina a head. She was what? She was helping Christina with her hair or something. I don't know. Who's Christina? She was on the couch. Christina's on the couch? Ryan Waller seems to be confusing the detective's questions, blurring together his recollection of two seemingly separate incidents, mixing together different people from different times. He repeatedly asserts that he doesn't know who police found lying on his couch. He doesn't know what she looks like, who she is, or why she was there. And after additional questioning, Waller also claims that he doesn't even know who his other roommate is. It's quickly going down as one of the most bizarre police interrogations in Phoenix history. What happened last night? I don't know. You don't know? I really don't. I just want to go to sleep and go to sleep. Oh. Well, you remember Heather hitting you in the eye, right? I don't remember after that because I just want to lay down and try to go to sleep. All right. I don't know what anybody was doing. I really don't. Who was in the house when you went to sleep? Christina and Heather. Christina and Heather? Mm hmm I don't know, man. I really don't. I really don't. You just don't know? I really don't, man. Or you don't want to tell me? I really don't know, man. I really don't. I just want to go and go to sleep, man. Ryan, you're not going to go anywhere. Well, Ryan, you're not going to go anywhere. The detective continues pressing on, hitting one confusing wall after another. Ryan Waller is either playing games with the veteran detective or very confused himself. Do you know what happened in your house last night? Mm-hmm. Is that house yours? Mm-hmm. Yours or your parents? Mine. You bought that house? Mm-hmm. Okay. Why, what happened? Hmm? I don't know what happened. You're all beat up, right? So tell me what happened. I don't know. I just want to go to sleep, man. That's it. Remember what happened to your nose? There's a big chunk out of your nose. I don't know. Someone grab you? Were you fighting with somebody? No, I need to go. I need to go back to sleep, man. I'm just tired, man. That's it. Didn't even do anything. I just want to go to sleep. You remember what time this happened? Your eye? Like one? Or maybe earlier? I don't know. I don't know. Do you know Eric's girlfriend? Yeah. What's her name? Heather. Eric's girlfriend's Heather? Mm hmm. Okay. Alicia. The girl that lives in your house. Mm -hmm. Do you know who she is? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, what about her? Do you remember what time she came home last night? Not really, why? I'm just asking. I don't. I really don't. Okay. She said when she came home last night, your eye was already like that. Mm-hmm. Do you remember letting her in the house? I think so. Was your eye already screwed up like that? It was later in the night after she got back. At like 2 in the morning, I was already sleeping though. Mm-hmm. So she got back at 2 in the morning? Yeah, I don't know from where. Okay. Waller has now identified the woman on the couch as potentially being one of three different women. None of them, according to him, are his girlfriend. The detective notes the visible chunk of skin missing from Waller's nose, and as time passes, he seems to be having more and more difficulty even speaking. This is the point when most experienced police interrogators might request medical assistance, or they might pick up on the subtle warning signs that something is going terribly wrong in front of them. But not here, not today. Mm. You're, you're saying that's Eric's girlfriend? Mm-mm. Or your girlfriend? Heather? Yeah. Mine. Heather's your girlfriend. All right. Was Heather over last night? Mm-hmm. All right. And Heather did this to you? What? Your eye. Uh-uh. Okay, who did that to you? Alicia. Alicia did that to you now? Mm-hmm. I swear. I'm not even lying, I swear. Okay. Why would Alicia do this to you? Why? I have no idea. Were you mad at Alicia? No, I don't know why. I don't know why. She probably hit it on something. I don't know. She could hit what on something? I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't know. I just want to go to sleep, man. That's it. Hey, Ryan? Huh? Huh? 
There's what? a dead girl in your living room. She's dead? Yes. Heather? I don't know. I want to know what happened in your house last night. The girl on the couch is dead? I don't know. If she's on the couch, she's dead. After sharing the revelation with Ryan Waller that the woman on his couch was now dead, something seems to break free from his jumbled mind. He recalls that someone came over to their house that night and did something to he and Heather, something that he had already shared with police nearly six hours before as he sat handcuffed in front of his own home. Well, these people came over with she and his dad with shoot and arrow bow and darts. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. They hit me and her with those. That's it. And Heather wasn't there. And Eric wasn't there. It was just me and Heather. What was there? You and Heather were there. And then what happened? And that's it. Richie and his dad tried to break in in the back. Richie and dad? His dad? Mm hmm. Who's Richie? I don't know. Well, you obviously know him. You know his name by he Richie. He used to live there. Was he a roommate of yours? He used to be. And they. They hit you and. They hit you? Yeah. Now it's Richie that hit you? Not Heather? No, Richie and his dad. Richie and his dad. They hit you? Yes. Why? Because they're trying to get their stuff. I don't know why. And they had some kind of. Bow and arrows? Mm hmm. They each had two revolvers and they didn't left any shells. Okay, you just said they had bow and arrows. Now they have revolvers? That's what I meant. They have revolvers. They have revolvers? Yes. And then what happened? And then they shot us with those. They shot both of you? Yeah. Where'd they shoot you at? I got shot in the eye. You I got think. shot in the eye? I think so. With a revolver? I think. I don't know, man. I don't know. Fuck. If you haven't guessed by now where the story is going, well, then neither has Detective Dalton, because he continues pressing Ryan Waller, his claims growing now even more seemingly unbelievable by the second. Then what happened? I don't know. You don't know a lot, Ryan. I don't, man. I really don't. Did you shoot Heather? Mm-mm. I heard you have a lot of guns in your house. Mm-mm. No? Mm-mm. Well, you know we're going to look. Mm-hmm. Ryan, why don't you tell me what really happened there? Because I don't believe... I really don't know, man. I really don't. I don't know. I can tell you anything, I swear. Well, I want you to tell me the truth. That's all I want. Richie and his dad came there. And I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't know why, but they put me in sleeping hold. And, like, they put me in sleeping hold with the arrows and shit. Like, I lived through the sh that crap. Okay, they, they put you in a sleeping hold? Yeah. What is that? I don't know. I don't know. I really don't. I don't know, man. What is a sleeping hold? I don't know. Well, explain it. I, I really don't think know. I'm coming out of your mouth. Explain that to me. What's a sleeping hole? I really don't know, man. Okay. You're telling me, you're, you're all over the board here, number one. You're saying bows and arrows, you're saying revolvers, and you're saying some other thing, and they, you're saying they shot you in the eye. Okay? They shot you with a revolver in your eye. Yes. And that's Is it. it a BB gun? No, it was a real gun, man. It was just a if revolver. They shot you in the eye with a revolver. You wouldn't be talking to me right now. How do you know? It was most likely you'd be dead. That's what I thought too, man. I really don't know. Okay. I really don't know, and I just want to go back to sleep and try to go back to bed. You're not going back to bed. Okay. That's not going to happen. All right, but what else, man? What am I going to do? Just tell me what I got to do. Right, get your feet off my chair, number one. Number two, what happened to Heather? I don't know, man. I really don't You're know. You're now saying Richie and his dad shot Heather. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yes. And they shot her with a revolver? Yes. And did not use any gun? They came with those guns? Mm -hmm. And they came through the where? They were breaking through it? Through the back. Through the back? By your door or is there another door? Through the back door. Through the back door? Is that off the kitchen? Mm -hmm. Some of what Ryan Waller was claiming was actually starting to make sense. He had previously lived with a roommate named Richie Carver, who did in fact have a father named Larry. But Waller had gotten into repeated altercations with his former roommate Richie before ultimately kicking him out of the house approximately one month before in late November. Somehow, amidst all of the confusion, things were actually starting to line up. really don't know. Did, did they break in or did you let them in? I let them in. But then what happened? Then they started shooting up the house. With a gun? Mm-hmm. Okay, and then what happened? That's it. What happened to Heather? Heather got shot. Where did she get shot? Inside the face once. She got s shot inside of the face? Mm-hmm. How close, how close were you to her when she got shot in the face? It was after I got shot, so I didn't even hear anything. So you got shot first? Uh -huh. And what happened? Did you fall to the ground? Yeah, I was trying to get up and shit, and I couldn't. I okay. don't know. And then she got shot? Mm-hmm. What, 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 what did you do? Nothing. Did you call 911? Uh-uh. Did you see if she was alive? She was sleeping still, and that's it. I just let her sleep. 
She got shot in the side of the face and you let her sleep? Yes. This does not make sense, Ryan. I know, I didn't mean to, man. I'm sorry. I didn't know she was passing out. That's because I got shot wrong once, too, and I was going to pass out. Okay, this is now, not before. I don't know. You're saying right now you've been shot? Yes. In the eye? Yes. With a revolver? Yes. All right. Detective Dalton continues on. Ryan Waller's story is still not making any sense. How could someone have been shot in the eye and still be sitting here now in a police interview room, alive and talking? He wasn't buying it. Not yet. You saw Richie and his dad shoot her. I missed that. You missed They shot you first. Okay. She's under a blanket. Heather is? I'm asking you. Is she under a blanket? I don't know. You're saying she's in the living room? Uh huh. She was. Okay. Do you remember what time did Richie and his dad come in? At 2 in the morning. No, you were here at 2 in the morning. I don't know exactly, man. I really don't know. You know Ashley. She's your roommate, right? Mm -mm. She stays in the next room next next to you. No. No? Never Who is she then? His daughter. Whose daughter? Richie's dad's daughter. Is 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 Ashley? Mm-hmm. Richie's dad's daughter. Richie's dad's daughter is Ashley. Mm-hmm. Man, I swear, I don't know. I just want to go home and go to sleep, man. I don't know. She came home at 9.30 and you answered the door. And you were look, look like that at 9.30 on Christmas Day. For Ashley? Ashley came home. Okay. You let her in. All right. I don't remember. I don't know. Get your feet off my seat. I don't know, man. I don't know, man. Ryan, you need to start telling me the truth because your story doesn't make sense. I'm trying, man. I don't know. Just ask me anything and I'll tell you the truth. Just ask me. Well, I'm trying to and you're not even coming close to the truth. Go ahead, ask me. What happened with you and Heather last night? Her dad came and shot the house. Waller continues jumbling together the key details of what happened, originally claiming that his former roommate Richie came to their apartment that night with his father and shot both him and his girlfriend Heather. But then he claims that Richie is actually his roommate's brother, and his roommate's name changes from Alicia to Ashley. It's enough to confuse anyone. But the one consistent theme throughout is that Ryan claims someone came to their apartment that night and shot both he and Heather. Her dad shot her. Mm-hmm. All right. And then leaves. Mm-hmm. And what did you do? I tried to go back to sleep. After you've been shot mm -hmm. in the eye, mm -hmm. you didn't know enough to call 911. Mm -mm. Why did you call 911? Because I was just trying to go to sleep. That's it. You just saw Richie's and his dad shoot your girlfriend, and you just felt like you needed to go to sleep? Something like that. I don't know, man. I really don't. Ryan, look at me. Ryan. Yes. I don't know, man. I really don't know. Why did you shoot Heather, Ryan? I didn't shoot Heather. She was already shot once by her brother, I swear. Richie. Yes. Richie shot his own sister. Yes, I swear. That's it. Sit down. Not me. And you've been shot in the eye. Yes. Seeing few other options, Detective Dalton leans in, asking to see the wounds to Ryan's face even closer, and hones in on the hole next to the young man's nose. My feet hurt, man. I don't know why. Get them off my table. Let me see your nose. Put your, put your, leg, put your legs down. Put your legs down. Bring, bring your face closer. Oh, my head hurts. Okay. Yeah, be, be right back. After leaning in to examine Ryan Waller's face, Detective Dalton abruptly stands up, his face suddenly showing grave concern. He immediately leaves the room to call for an ambulance. There's a bullet hole next to Ryan Waller's nose, and he hasn't been provided any medical attention in the now six hours he has been in police custody. Hey, Ryan? Yes? I got the fire department coming to take a look at it. They're, they're going to probably take you to the hospital. You're taking me to the hospital? Yeah, we're going to take you to the hospital. Why? Well, if you've seen your face and the way you're doing things, it just it doesn't make sense right now, okay? We're just going to make sure you're okay. I don't want to go back to bed, man. Well, that's the problem. If you have some kind of head injury, you shouldn't be sleeping, okay? Well, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. There you go. All right. So just, we're going to wait for the fire department here. So who is Richie? Richie? And his dad. He used to live there. Get up this year. What's his last name? I don't even know. Uh-huh. I don't know. You don't remember where you got shot? Mm -mm. I think I only got shot once in the eyeball. And then you just wanted to go to sleep? Yeah. Huh? Did you go back to bed after the shooting? Mm-hmm. Did you and Heather have a relationship? Not after the shooting, no. No, 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 not after the shooting, before the shooting. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. 
So she was your girlfriend? Kind of, not really. And did... Why did Richie and her dad... Why did Richie shoot you and then shoot her? Doesn't make sense. They came in shooting at everybody. I don't know why. I really don't know why. I really don't know why. Okay, and it's Heather's brother, Richie? Mm-mm. You said it was, it was Heather's dad. Is it Heather's dad or is it just Richie and his dad? Richie and his dad. No, it has nothing to do with Heather. Okay, Heather is not related to Richie or the dad. Mm-mm. And when did Richie live with you? I don't know, like a week, man. When? When? I don't know. Like a week ago? Two weeks ago? A month ago? Maybe. We're going to get the fire department to come in and take a look at you. I'm probably going to take you to the hospital, okay? okay? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Okay, and they're going to take care of you. All right. Just, just stay right there. Detective Dalton releases the handcuff from Ryan Waller's wrist and directs him to stay in the seat until paramedics arrive. After a momentary absence, Detective Dalton returns to the interview room with four paramedics and another police staffer. He explains the situation at hand and his new theory, that Ryan Waller is no murder suspect at all, but a gunshot victim who is likely gravely injured and has little time. Hey guys. Hey guys. I think you're not going to believe this one. I can't believe it either. You're right. I've already heard the story. I can't believe it. Uh, this is just my observations that this might be an entrance, this might be an exit, this might be into the... And he's acting uh, like he has a serious head injury, which would make sense. So, what you guys hey. confirm? Right. No. Yeah, we'll take him. I don't know why. Can tell. Did that all? Has it been like that before, or just happened tonight? I think just for like a day or so. What, so it happened what? The other night? I don't know. You don't know what happened. Were there guns around? This kid Eric did it. I don't know how he did it exactly. He might have been shot. I don't know. I really don't know. I don't know. It looks really like bad. it went right through, huh? Yeah, it might have. I don't know. <laughs> Where are you from, man? Do you live in town? Or? I was born in Michigan. Um, I'm from here. I got his name and everything. Yeah, I've got it. Do you have the in-laws in town for Christmas? Huh? Do you have the in-laws in town or anything? I think it's done. Huh? Good night. Your ride's here. Check out. Yeah, he's Where? Where are we going? We gotta go to the hospital. Get checked out, bro. Look like shot right in the face. Oh, no. Paramedics raced Ryan Waller to a nearby hospital where it was confirmed that he had been shot twice in the head once through the eye directly adjacent to his nose and again behind his left ear. Neither bullet exited his brain, and both caused major irreversible damage. A surgeon had to remove part of Waller's brain and both of his eyes later that day just to save his life. While Ryan Waller sat handcuffed in the back of the police patrol car in front of his home for nearly five hours, suffering tremendously from two gunshot wounds to the head, responding paramedics came and went, and not a single one was alerted to check on him, even though he presented obvious signs of significant trauma to his face and head. Waller's girlfriend, Heather Kwan, was pronounced dead on the scene. She suffered one fatal gunshot wound to the head from the same 22 caliber revolver that Ryan had been shot with. The responding coroner reported that rigor mortis had already set in on Heather Kwan's body well before the early morning hours of December 26th, and that she had likely died sometime within the last few days. As Ryan Waller was treated for his injuries, more and more details began to emerge, and police looked into Richie and Larry Carver, the father-son duo who Waller initially claimed entered his home, shooting both he and Heather in the head. Ryan Waller and Richie Carver were former roommates, and had gotten into multiple armed confrontations with one another in the weeks preceding Heather's murder. Waller eventually kicked his then-roommate out, and according to court records, may have spread a rumor that he pistol-whipped Carver and his father while they were removing Richie's things from the home. The two men apparently came to Waller's apartment the evening of December 23rd, nearly 72 hours before police were first dispatched to the home to render their retaliation against Waller for the allegedly bogus claims. The new information revealed that Ryan Waller, suffering from a traumatic and rapidly evolving brain injury, likely wandered about his apartment for nearly three full days while his girlfriend lay dead on their living room couch, unsure of what had happened, believing she had simply went to sleep after being shot. Heather Kwan, who had come over that evening to eat pizza and watch a movie with her boyfriend, was likely murdered as an abrupt afterthought once both men had entered the home and realized that she had witnessed their attempted murder of Ryan. After both men were eventually caught and arrested, Richie Carver's mother and Larry's wife, Cheryl, contacted Phoenix police to alert them that both men had left her house together on December 23rd between the hours of 8 and 9 o'clock in the evening to go to Ryan Waller's house to, quote, check on some property and see about a pistol whipping incident. She revealed to police that when they returned later that evening, Larry told her that he, quote, fucked up and killed two people and that he had to get out of town fast. Larry Carver then gathered a stockpile of 22 caliber ammunition from a desk drawer and hit the road for California. Richie Carver was eventually convicted of felony murder, burglary, aggravated assault, and misconduct involving weapons, and was sentenced to a term of natural life in prison without the possibility of parole. 
As Richie's father Larry's trial approached, his wife Cheryl had a change of heart. Where she had previously confided to police the details of her husband's alleged confession, she now decided to evoke marital privilege, which ultimately permitted her to refuse to testify against her husband at his trial. And all charges were eventually dropped against Larry Carver, where he remained a free man until a new bill was drafted in 2009 called Heather's Law which allows an exception to the marital privilege law in the event one spouse voluntarily provides police with information leading to the other spouse's involvement in a high-profile crime. After two additional rounds of appeal and two separate trials, Larry Carver was ultimately convicted in 2011 of first-degree murder, attempted first-degree murder, burglary, and aggravated assault. He was sentenced to a term of natural life in prison without the possibility of parole. Both Larry and Richie Carver remain incarcerated in the Arizona Department of Corrections to this day. Ryan Waller would go on to live a tragically limited life, completely blind and dependent upon his parents' care, suffering daily from a debilitating brain injury until he passed away from complications related to his attempted murder on January 20th, 2016. His life is a testament to just how horribly wrong things can go when the justice system plays out in reverse and police hone in on their prime suspect and consider them guilty until proven innocent. You meet someone online and there's this instant connection. It's amazing how much the two of you just seem to click. They live somewhere far away and there's some plausible reason they can't travel to meet you. They tell you they're in love with you and you feel optimistic for the first time in a long time. They have a successful career yet somehow they need money from you to solve a short-term problem, always with the promise of paying you back. Time goes on and they need more money more urgently. You've started to see the cracks and begin to wonder whether they've been lying this whole time. All of a sudden, it hits you. You've been scammed. Fool Me Twice is the story of my mother, Jules Hannaford, a woman who was drawn into the dangerous world of sweetheart scams. After a trip overseas to meet a stranger, a dangerous altercation in a Manchester hotel room, and thousands of pounds lost for good, she's here to tell her story. Fool Me Twice, a true crime podcast, is available on Apple Podcasts, Ozcast Network, and anywhere you listen to your podcasts. Thank you for listening to Invisible Choir. This episode contains sensitive material, including graphic depictions of violence or abuse against children, which some listeners may find especially distressing or traumatic. Listener discretion is advised. My mind tried to kill me. Guys, we're trying to kill each other. Let me get to it. Welcome to another edition of Felony Friday on Invisible Choir Premium. I'm your host, Michael Ojibwe. Thank you to each and every one of you, our patrons, for your continued support. We are down to just two team members here at Invisible Choir, so I've been burning the midnight oil to be able to continue to bring you these weekly cases, always told in a respectful and quality manner. Your generous support is why this show continues to grow, so from the bottom of my heart, thank you. This week, we're covering a case that has been making the rounds on social media, where officers in Henderson, Nevada, stumbled into a truly horrendous crime scene and had only seconds to act when they saw that an innocent child's life was at stake. It's a case we're calling Unmotherly Love. On the sunny, warm afternoon of October 21st, 2019, residents of the Equestrian on Eastern Luxury Apartment Complex in Henderson, Nevada are enjoying another lazy afternoon in front of the pool. The apartment complex boasts a safe community living experience, complete with secure gated access, a 24-hour fitness center and spa, and a private movie theater exclusively for its residents. It seems the perfect place to raise a family, and sits only a comfortable 25-minute drive from the entertainment capital of the United States, Las Vegas. But the assumed peace and tranquility of the daylight was tragically shattered just after 12.15 p.m. when three gunshots rang out in quick succession. Neighbors received text message alerts from Henderson police that there had been a shooting in the area and to remain sheltered in place. 
As the situation unfolded, it wouldn't take long before the tragic details of what transpired would shock the community. Yeah, I've talked to people living here in what everyone describes as a safe, quiet apartment complex in a nice part of town. I've talked to Henderson police. Their stories, along with new information we have from Henderson PD, is connecting the dots on what happened this afternoon. Something about a gunshot. Obviously, this is a, a tragedy for anybody involved in a situation like this. Yeah, it's gut-wrenching. Just heard sirens. And more of them, and more of them. It all started with a 911 call around noon today. That call was uh, placed by the juvenile. Details of the call suggested that a violent domestic was occurring involving an adult and in a juvenile. Henderson police sent officers to the equestrian apartments on Eastern. According to new information we got tonight, they found a 7-year-old boy with gruesome injuries. The boy was actually only six years old and had phoned 911 prior to the gunshots ringing out to report a truly horrific scene in his mother's upstairs apartment at the equestrian. Henderson 911, what is the address of the emergency? Uh, 2222, Summers Heights Park. Okay, what is it? My mic's on camera. Yeah, we're going to kill each other. So we're going to do it. Okay, and what's it? Is it an apartment complex? 2222, building 22. Okay, what's the name of the apartment complex? You're, not, you're giving me an apartment number, not, it's not an address. Okay, we're probably around it. We've got to kill each other. The incoherent ramblings of the adult woman in the background immediately raise alarm with the operator when she whispers, we've got to kill each other. Amidst the chaos, the child continues struggling for control of the phone. What is the name of the apartment complex? 222, building 22. I know, but what apartment complex are you in? You're not giving me an address. You're giving me a unit number. I'm sorry? Equestrian. Okay. I'm going to I know. The one at 10701 Step Eastern? Okay. What is your name? The cries of the six-year-old boy are terrifying as he asks repeatedly, quote, please 911 help me, my mother is trying to kill me. While trying to gather additional details for responding police, the call is abruptly terminated and the operator is unable to reconnect. For police arriving on scene just minutes later, what they find at the top of the stairs in the first apartment is utterly heartbreaking. Central 2041 attempting contact. Hello, oh, 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 shit. Good medical. Henderson, Nevada police officers Edward Little and Patrick McCarrick are shocked to see the boy who initially made the call to 911 standing at the doorway when they first enter. He slowly walks outside shirtless and covered in blood. It is immediately clear that he's been stabbed multiple times, allegedly, by his mother, who still stands behind him, nearly entirely naked, holding a knife. When officers notice the weapon, the scene immediately turns violent as she lunges towards the nearest officer. What's going on? What's going on? Oh my God! Stop! 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 The partially nude woman lunges at the officer, crying out, You'll have to kill me. In the struggle, he attempts to reholster his service weapon so that he can fight off her attempts at stabbing him, and they both fall to the floor. As they continue wrestling on the ground, the woman somehow gains control of his gun, and the situation quickly escalates from dire to worse. After securing the boy around the corner, the other officer enters the apartment behind them, his weapon drawn, and demands she stop resisting. The entire thing is over in a matter of seconds. Stop it! Sit down. Uh, sit down. Uh, sit down. 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 Sit During the struggle, 37-year-old Claudia Nadia Rodriguez grabbed for the officer's firearm while simultaneously attacking him with a knife. The two desperately fought over control of the weapon. At one point, she was able to insert her finger into the trigger assembly, discharging the weapon inside of the apartment. The other officer immediately entered after his partner called out, She's got my gun, firing two shots at her and hitting her once in the head. She was transported to the Sunrise Hospital and Medical Center and pronounced dead a short while later. The six-year-old boy, still barely coherent, stood watching the entire thing unfold in the hallway outside of his home. Police carried him to a waiting ambulance, where he was rushed to the University Medical Center, undergoing emergency surgery that ultimately saved his life. How he survived his mother's seemingly random attack is unbelievable. Henderson police released a debriefing on the incident in the days immediately following, revealing the incredible extent of his injuries and how mere seconds could have meant the difference had officers not immediately intervened. 
We also confirm that the victim child suffered 25 stab wounds during the ordeal. The City of Henderson Police Department recognizes that this tragedy will have lasting effects on everyone involved. We would also like to remind everyone that this is an ongoing investigation and the facts and circumstances as we now know them may change as information becomes available. This is the text message residents who live inside of the equestrian on Eastern Apartments received, sparking panic and concern. There's an active scene on property. Please stay indoors until further notified. Nobody really knew what was going on. There has to be a better way to let people know what's going on. Almost two hours later, they received another text. There was a shooting. This is a, a tragedy for anybody involved in a situation like this, so we want to use due care and take care of everyone as best we can. Henderson police were called to the area just after noon. They say a boy was stabbed by his mother. How does it get to that point? You know, why, why wasn't something done sooner? Surely somebody knew. This woman didn't want to show her face on camera, but she told us she heard commotion in the residents often. My heart just breaks for everybody. The, the poor policeman that is forced into that kind of a situation. I mean, you know, the poor woman that obviously lost it, that she started attacking a child. What makes this case particularly difficult to understand, like many others involving domestic violence, is that all the warning signs were already present, some for years. The neighbors at the equestrian complex reported regularly hearing arguments and other disruptions coming from Rodriguez's apartment. Court records also revealed that Claudia and her six-year-old son's father were in the middle of a bitter custody dispute, and that the father repeatedly alleged her behavior had become increasingly more violent towards him and the child since 2017. The boy's father filed a motion alleging that Rodriguez's mental state had deteriorated significantly and that she was, quote, mentally and physically abusive towards him and her two older children from a previous relationship. An in-depth review by the Las Vegas Sun also revealed that Rodriguez allegedly randomly lashed out and that her, quote, violent temper resulted in regular public tantrums that were beginning to negatively affect her six-year-old son, which is precisely why his father had been fighting so diligently to gain custody of the boy. Anytime a tragedy like this occurs so close to home, we all reflect. Some of us wonder, could we have done something more? Were there signs that we missed as neighbors or relatives? Because I feel as a community, we have to do better. Um, the fact that I knew who this woman was, but I was not personally attached to her, makes me somewhat like I'm responsible. As a mom, I have to step up. I have to do better. Like, it's my wake up call, you know? And it's not like to move out of here. It's just to like, if I notice something, I hear something, I see something, I need to get more involved. But you never know until you hit rock bottom where you're like, oh my gosh, and for whatever reason, she felt this is what she needed to do, and I don't agree with it, but people should have stepped in, people should have helped her out. Though this case is still under active investigation, the Henderson Police Department released a photograph of the six-year-old boy's t-shirt, one that was once bright green that read, like a boss across the front, that after the attack was stained a horrible dark black with blood, the picture clearly showing seven stab wounds marked in the front neck area and 18 more all across the back. The silver lining here, if you can even call it that, is that somehow, miraculously, this young boy survived when so many others likely wouldn't have. He dialed 911 while his mother viciously fought to kill him, and oddly, while on the line, she gave the address so that police could respond, ultimately saving the boy's life while taking hers in the process. Thank <laughs> you.